All right, so we'll call the select board meeting for Wednesday, April 7th, 2021 to order. Uh, just a reminder that this meeting is being recorded and that all votes will be taken via roll call. And in attendance from the select board is me, David Phil. We have Jane Nevinsmith, Joyce Chunglo, John Muskevitz, and Christian Stanley. Uh, first order of business is the consent agenda for this evening. We have warrants PR2120, AP2140, AP2140S, AP2140V. Uh, no minutes, but we have an agricultural commission resignation as a full member and reappointment as an alternate member for William Hendrick. And that's it. So moved. Any other, or can I get a second? Second by Christian. Any other discussion? Okay, Jennifer. Roll call vote. Phil? Yes. Chungalo? Yes. Stanley? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Liskevitz? Yes. Thank you. All right. All right. And moving right along, we have public comments. Uh, we're gonna limit this to 15 minutes. Please limit your comments to three minutes per person so that other people may speak. Uh, anybody that's here for public comments, turn on your camera, wave at us, let us know you're here. All right, last call, anybody for public comments? <coughs> Okay, well, we'll keep moving on. Uh, Carolyn, do you want to hit the administrator report real quick? Uh, you're, you're muted. muted. <laughs> I can't see her either. <laughs> <coughs> There's no video. I see her. She, she's on for everybody else. When she starts talking, you'll see. I'm here. Sorry about that. I was trying to, I wasn't, David, David caught me off guard. I was looking for my, uh, my notes here. Sorry about because, that. That's oh, okay. Uh, I just want to give you an update on the, uh, getting uh, ready to open up. Uh, we, the counters have been replaced or are in the process. Um, I think they're actually still in the building right now. And uh, I wanted to let you know that I did talk. Um, I finished talking with both our representative and our Senator to talk about the sewer project and to ask for funding. And I also let them both know about Exotic Auto. Um, the last meeting that we had, I hadn't spoken um, with Senator Comerford's chief of staff and I was able to do that. Um, but the, I do wanna point out and um, show my appreciation and I think you will too, to uh, Dan Zadonik who became aware of some property on Route 9 that might be of interest to Paul, the owner of Exotic Auto and um, he is going to pursue that. And he just was really appreciative that Dan um, took the time to give me that information. So thank you to Dan. And we had our walkthrough for the second phase of the fiber optic project yesterday. And we have five, so far we have five uh, requests for RFP for North Hadley Village Hall, which that's really good news. And I think the real estate agent, Jennifer, if I'm right, showed it this morning. Yep, she said you're right. Yes, yes, she okay. did. Okay, and um, and I so uh, the next select board meeting, I will the warrant will be ready to have a vote for you to close that as well. So we're wrapping that up. I'll have I'll have a lot more information for you at the next select board meeting. So that's it. All right, that was easy. Yeah, it was uh, easy. Let's do. Uh, you want to do a COVID nineteen update while we have a few minutes? So the only update I have is uh, things are going well in the building and um, the transitions that we're making with the um, with the offices. I think that's been a really good adjustment. Uh, Teresa has been wonderful, our receptionist, and um, people are definitely coming in. Um, I have no other updates. I have not talked to Dr. Mosler recently, so I don't and I don't think she's on. So I don't have any update from the Board of Health regarding that. Okay. Sounds good. We'll keep moving. Uh, uh, there, the, uh, on the COVID-19 update, there was something about a letter of support for the Hampshire Mall. Is that something we wanted to talk about? 
Yes, you want your licensing coordinator to remove that from the old agenda. My apologies. Oh, sorry. Okay, I just saw it there and we skipped over it. So I didn't know. I figured if they needed I was like, uh, yep. I remember that. <laughs> it's been a very, very active week here at Town Hall. And sorry, that's my fault. That's okay. It's, it's okay. I just saw it there and didn't want to miss it if there was something they needed from us. So that's all. Okay. Um, and we've got a few minutes before our appointments. Amy, do you want to talk uh, finance for a few minutes? Sure. All right. So the update is we met uh, last night and we met with inspections, uh, police, fire, and schools. So the school is pretty straightforward because they're, we're doing level funding there and they're getting other monies uh, through other avenues um, that will help out with with their increase. So the next is the uh, police and fire. Well, and inspections was easy too, but the, there's not a whole lot of, there's no fat in there. We've been trying to look for some things. Now, can we, can there be a little tweak here? Maybe a little tweak there, but we're, we're not talking very much money. So, I mean, as far as um, I'm not, see, it's going to be very, very difficult um, to come up with, at least looking at the police and fire. It, it, I don't see how I'm gonna come up with too much money. What happens is some of these line items that we really pushed last time for, um, they, they, uh, it, was, it was too short. They, a lot of these items were short and they were short and they went over. So now um, I don't wanna cut it too short because you know, then they're gonna then they're gonna go over again. So right now, I'm hoping, yeah, maybe overtime. We have to have them have some overtime in case they need it. But if they don't need it, then it'll go back to free cash. So, anyways, I just want to say, and then the the leadership that um, that we were seeing was awesome. Um, you know, we have the chiefs here, and and what they're doing is they're. They're saying, I don't want an increase. If I, if my staff doesn't have an, an increase, I don't, I'm not taking an increase, whether or not their contract says it. But I was pretty impressed with, you know, their leadership there. And um, also, I saw some things that we talked about, which could help down the road. Um, let's use an example. Um, Mike uh, uh, Mason, he has he's going for a grant to, we already gave him the money for the vests, the um, ballistic vests. He's trying to get that money back in grant funding. So maybe that'll be more money coming to us. So they're still, even though there's money that they've already been given, they're trying to get more money back for the town. So they're working hard. Um, so that was fabulous. Um, other than that, uh, we're gonna see where, what we can do. I mean. That was a union contract anyways. There wasn't a lot of stuff that we could do with that one. Um, but to go on to what was really interesting um, too that I think that um, maybe you could uh, look at was um, Dan Zadonic had a report that we asked for that um, was more an analysis to tell us what each taxpayer is gonna be in more like dollars, which was a great report. And I think you should see that. And also Linda reviewed the, um, she had some uh, review on the, on the revenue. So if you do have a little bit of time, it would probably be great if they could show that to you. And they're ready. They're ready to do that. Okay. Yeah, we've got about 10 minutes, so. Okay. Okay. Um, they're working in the hall, so I'm going to uh, keep my mask on. But um, uh, I guess I can share. Uh, Okay, today you would have received uh, the full budget report. This is our, uh, our, our new equivalent of what David would give with, without, all, without the words. <laughs> so we have the, uh, it starts with the, with the uh, first page is revenue. You have a, which we already went over, but I'll come back. Linda, Linda we're seeing Dan's report. Huh, okay. New share. How about that? Yep. Okay. 
Um, all right. So the first page is revenues. I'm just, I'm not, I'm, we're not going to stop here. I'm, the second two pages are the expenditure summary that you've seen before. Then it goes into the enterprise funds, revenues and expenditures, and then a summary of each and how would they would be ba balanced, the general fund and the enterprise fund. And then we go into one after the other, the itemized budgets in the same order as you have in the summary page. So it goes all the way through to the end. The, uh, so that has been um, that has been filed formally. As of yesterday, we gave it to the finance committee and hopefully you'll have it today. So um, the, ones, the one thing we wanted to draw your attention to, because I think it, it kind of went off from what our original intentions, if I could draw, if you can see the property tax uh, section here, it's kind of, it's construed as if this was a, a 7.2% in people's taxes. The purpose of this, this sheet was to report revenues and how they compare to the year before. And our revenues in that category will increase by 7, 2% if we get, if we are allowed to, um, if, if we go there, if we follow these recommendations. But I just want to point out it includes new growth, which doesn't impact, doesn't impact any current taxpayers bill at all. That's new bills out to out new people. And then some of the sec, uh, the two and a half percent in the second year, again, goes to those original ones. Um, so anyways, I, I'm not saying that they're not going to go up, but now this is where I want to say that if you want to know how it affects the tax rate, that's a, that's a different story. That is, that's Dan's story. So I'm going to now switch over, to, um, I'm going to switch over to his table and, um, and let him explain how it actually affects the tax rate. All right, let me do a new share and go back to, now is this table up again, Carolyn? Is that Dan's? Yep. Okay. All right, is Dan on? Uh, what this table is, the finance committee asked how different changes in the, in the levy would affect individual taxpayers. And this chart goes from a $250,000 assessment to a $900,000 assessment for a house. And the highlighted line is basically three, the 350,000. And that's about the average assessment. The first column shows what we're paying, what people are paying this year, which is 4,200. The second column is just this year, next year's two and a half percent increase plus the new growth. So you can see that the, the percentage is actually a 2.42% increase because a portion of the 2.5% gets picked up by the new growth value. And then what I did was I just went from 3%, 3.5, 4, 4.5, 5, and 6.25, and which is the max. And it shows the changes in the amount that you could raise by taxation above it. And it shows the impact on each bill. So basically every half a percent increase is going to be about $21. That's per thousand, correct? Uh, no, that's for, that's the whole bill. That's the whole bill. Okay. I think that needs to be, um, I yeah, don't think people understand that. So the, when we say an increase, it's the total bill and not the per thousand of their assessment. Yeah, the 350, if you were to raise the full levy, it would go up $263. If you were to okay. just do two and a half, it would be 4302. So it'd go up 102. Okay. And this also assumes no changes in values or commercial and industrial values going down. That's something that we're going to have to look at probably after town meeting, uh, possibly looking at a split rate or taxes, residential taxes might skyrocket if values are gonna drop or we think they're gonna drop for a commercial. So that was, I think two meetings ago uh, where it was brought up that we didn't go for our full uh, increase uh, two years ago, we kept things stable last year. And so we could make it up, you know, possibly this year with a 6.25%. And I think that's what shocked a lot of people with, with hearing at a six or more percent increase in their taxes. So um, I, I don't think there was so much worry about the column in, on Linda's chart of the 7.25. I think that was 
from, from what I've heard, fairly well understood. I think it was more a concern that we're going to try to quote unquote, make up for two or three years worth of uh, increases in one year. I do think though, this is a really great way to present the information to everybody, because I think we give that 350,000 number or the per thousand, you know, dollars per thousand number for increases. And it's confusing. And I like this table because if you know your assessed value of your house or property, you can look it up and see exactly what your increase would be. So I really like the way this is presented, Dan. I agree. I think Dan's done a great job. And instead of just giving us the average house would do this, you everybody can look at their specific assessment. And I think that that will really be better understood. Yeah, I do too. So what's the recommended increase? Uh, I'm not making a recommendation at this point. This is just okay. for you for informational purposes. Okay. I mean, it, it would depend on how much you want to spend out of in the budget. Okay. So Dan, could you send this to the, to the board? Yep. Yeah, not a problem. And it's Paul actually Benj it's actually under town administrator report. I think oh, that's okay. where I asked Jennifer to put it. I, right. I, yeah, I probably should have put it here, but <laughs> so it should be on board docs right now. All right, cool. Paul I Benjamin had suggested last night that this be handed out at town meeting as well. And I, yeah, I think so also. That's a good idea, but I think we need to co compress the numbers instead of having 2.42 to 6.25, just putting down the 21, the 22, and then whatever you guys are going to recommend for 20, for 22. Right. Or eliminating a few of the, the ranges there. Yeah. But it, I mean, we're going to have a budget by the time we go to town meeting. So if we can punch in whatever the percentage increase we're looking at, and then, um, you know, compare it to last year, I think this will be a good way for people to know how much it's actually going to cost them mm -hmm. versus the, you know, however many dollars per thousand. Do you know what our revenue would be, um, Dan? I know you've done a lot of work on this, and I hate to even ask you if 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 we did increase at each one at one of these levels between high and low, what would be the amount that we would um, get for taxes? Uh, it's on the the second line down, the levy increase. Oh, so wait the a minute. two and a half percent would be four hundred one. And then if you go all the way up to the end, the 6.25 would be 898,000. Okay. Slightly different than the number on here because that's the total levy. And we're mm -hmm. not allowed to raise a portion of a cent on the tax rate. So okay. We have to round down. Okay. Th thank you. I was just wondering what that would be. Thank you for pointing that out. And what was our tax rate before we lowered it last fall? It was 1278, but the values were significantly lower. So the, the fiscal 20 bill, if you were to add it in, it would, it would be 4,200 for 20 and 4,200 for 21. Yep. Okay. We kept it the same. Yeah, the average bill stayed the same, but because the values went up, the rate dropped from 1278 to $12. Correct, right. All right. Okay. All right, great job, Dan, appreciate it much. Any other questions for Dan or Amy or Linda? Uh, hey, Caroline, you got Linda's copy of this? A copy of this also you can put online or just make a set that, of copies? That's there too. They're both there and well, they're both there in board docs. Okay. Yeah. They weren't, when I looked in board docs, I didn't have anything under your administrative report. So tomorrow I'll go and I'll look at it. Yeah. I, yeah. That, yeah. It, I think I sent it to Jennifer around five o'clock. So, well, for heaven's sake, <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a computer in my car. <laughs> so I own that one. Sorry. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank that's, you. I'll pull it off the computer tomorrow. That's why, Thank uh, you. That's why we have sharing. But um, if you want, <laughs> if anyone, if anyone wants to email directly, yeah. I, I can get, I can email it to you. Want me to email it to you, John? Is that easier than doc, board docs? Yeah, sure, if you could. Okay. I think what? if you send it to all of us, it would be great. Thank you. Okay, I'll do that. 
Thanks, Linda. Appreciate it. Sure. Amy, uh, who, uh, who do you have left to meet with? Or, or was the, were those the first departments you met with uh, the other night? Those were the first. So we will meet next Monday. Uh, so we have everybody else. So all we did was police, fire, inspections, and school. Okay. Yep. Uh, do you need anything from us at this point or? Not, not yet. Okay. Well, thank you to you and the finance committee. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks. All right. So we'll move on here. Um, we had 5.1. We're going to pass over that, which is the change of manager for the American Legion. We're not quite ready to do that yet. Uh, it is 5.50. So we're 5.2 change of beneficial interest for Texas Roadhouse. Uh, Jennifer, do you want to take this? Yes. Um, so Texas Roadhouse um, is doing a change of beneficial interest. Um, I don't know if everybody saw or not, but their um, the CEO of Texas Roadhouse uh, died, and so they are uh, requesting a change of uh, beneficial interest. Um, the ABCC has processed this for them already, just because of the special circumstances behind it. Um, and the ABCC has approved of everything. It's no changes here in the store. It's really corporate that we require them to update us. So I'm, I'm asking for the select board to approve the change of beneficial interest. So moved. Second. Yeah, second. Motion by Joyce, second by Jane. And Jennifer, I assume we charge them the $100 change fee that we do for these? We, we do. Okay, yeah. cool. All right, any other comments on this? Roll call vote, Jennifer. Roll call vote, Phil. Yes. Chunglo. Yes. Stanley. Yes. Nevin Smith. Yes. And Wiscavitz. Yes. Thank you all. All right. And uh, we said 555 is uh, the clerk here, Jessica. Nope. I don't think she was attending. She said that all the information you needed was in the email. Um, and I can, yeah, and I can explain it as well. All right. right. Uh, but, uh, go ahead, Carolyn, if you want to, this is a 6.1 town clerk precinct vote. Yeah, this is regarding the census, the 2020 census, that if the, uh, a town exceeded 6,199 inhabitants uh, and or the, the intent was to remain one precinct town. Hadley is one precinct. That Hadley's, the census is not that high. And the town clerk asked that the, she needs to have a vote that you're gonna remain one single uh, precinct. Yeah. I, I move that we do that. Yeah. Do we have Second. to do a specific language or motion or just vote on it? I think you can just vote on it. Okay. Second. The second. All right, motion by Jane, second by Joyce. Any further discussion on that? I just, it makes sense because it already costs a lot of money to run an election as it is. And if we have double the poll workers, double the mate, the you know cleaning bills for the buildings. Um, but anything else? All right, Jennifer. Bill call vote, Phil? Yes. Chungalo? Yes. Stanley? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Scavitz. Yes. Thank you. And so this will keep it as one precinct until we vote otherwise or until another census comes out. Is that how it works or? Up to 10 years until the next federal census is taken in the year 2030. Sounds good. There can't be more things we only have to vote on once every 10 years. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So now we are here, Conservation Commission 5.3 for 555 appointment. And um, this was related to our conversation about the river and permitting from last week. Uh, and there was concerns about some of the fees that were being charged um, and some, I, I guess, the interpretation of campers being structures and things along those lines. So it looks like Paulette's here and anybody else from conservation? Tony? And, and Janice yeah. is here too. Where's Janice? Am I uh, she is, I think. Oh, I see her. Yep. All right. Okay. All right. So, um, Paulette, I'll let you go. Want to uh, 
explain where some of these fees are coming from and uh, how these campers are being interpreted by the Conservation Commission? Sure. The um, State Wetlands Protection Act actually establishes the list of fees for any activity within a resource area. They also establish the fact that if you are in a riverfront and you are in a, another resource area, such as floodplain or buffer zone, that the fee has to be 50% um, more of that to cover the review on that. Um, we, most of the permits that are coming before the commission for campers, because they can go out of the first 100 foot riverfront area, the riverfront area is 200 feet. The first 100 feet is considered the most um, critical. And even if someone uh, filed a request for determination in the first 100 feet, the commission's obligation under the Wetlands Protection Act would be to require a notice of intent based on the language of the law. Um, the fees that are charged now, um, and we've, we've had some discussions on this as to what does a camper constitute? Well, we have to look at it from what is the closest thing to it because campers are not specifically listed. So what we have asked or what we have looked at, and I'm just trying to find it. Um, a second. The fees that we are looking at are based on the, the use. And since a single family house is the closest thing to a camper, because it will be a fold or a residential structure um, in there for six months out of the year that we chose 100 in that category because A, it's the lowest category fee there is. If we chose it to be under other, um, Janice, you can help me on that because I can't find my paper right at the moment. It would be, uh, I believe, $250 fee. Is that right, Janice? I don't have it in front of me either. Okay, but hang on. Let me see if I can. Two, yeah, I had it here. I'm just trying to switch between things here. Yeah, so category one is... Um, would be considered work on a single family residential lot. So it's work on a single family residential lot, including a house addition, a deck, a garage, a garden, a pool, a shed, or a driveway. Um, so any of those things um, are considered under that and construction of a dock or a pier or other coastal engineering structure. So if they were going to do site preparation, that would be a different, that would still be under category one, um, any type of control of vegetation, resource improvement activities in, uh, with wells, agricultural projects. Those, all of those things are one fee. The second category, things go up from there. Um, well, that, that's $500 for category uh, two. For category two, thank you. Yep. So category two is $500 in activity. So it goes up based on the potential use. Now, what we've looked at, and I know there's been some questions and I'm gonna find it here, what I've got. Um, if we are looking at, um, because everyone looks at the definitions, so what are they called? So under um, activity, Activity means um, any form of draining, dumping, dredging, damming, discharging, excavating, filling, or grading, um, erection, reconstruction, expansion of any buildings or structures, um, driving of pilings, and it says, uh, let's see, changing of runoff characteristics and discharge of pollutants and the destruction of plant life. Alter means... Um, 
a number of different things such as um, destruction of vegetation. And I'm just trying to find the things that are applicable um, in there. So the commission, because we are enforcing the Wetlands Protection Act, we can't waive any of the fees. 50% of the fee goes to the state the other 50% of the fee goes to the commission and that pays the salary of our staff person. So we don't have the ability to waive that fee. So I just wanna, and I'm not saying this is right or wrong, but I wanna just put this out there for people to understand. So I'm not a river camper, but I have a camper and I have to have a license plate on it and auto insurance because it's considered an automobile by the state of Massachusetts. And if I were to go through this, the, the zoning permitting process, I guess, uh, to comply with the bylaw, um, that permit is for 179 days or less. So six months or less. Um, I have a field, something like that down Cemetery Road and I wanna park my camper there. It's on wheels, it can be moved, it's mobile, still has to have a license plate on it, is still assessed by the town as a vehicle for excise tax purposes. Um, in case of a flood, something like that, it can be moved quickly. Um, it's not a structure because I can't get homeowner's insurance or any other property insurance on that. No insurance company will write that, it's an auto premium only. Uh, that's, I think, some of the difficulty people are having with it being classified as a structure and as a temp and it's a temporary activity of that because we're only issuing a permit that's valid for six months or less. So um, it's but square that. On, the permit that people are getting from the Conservation Commission and from the town is for three years. And under a notice of intent, before the three year period has expired, they could come in and ask for another three year extension. So they have the ability to pay once, and if they don't let their permit run out, to keep renewing it for three years. Request for determination is good for three years. It doesn't have an extension, but that is only $50. The majority of the permits that are coming in qualify under request for determination, and that's a $50 fee, and that's good for three years. But if the activity is limited to six months or less per year, which is what the permit that Tommy's issuing mm -hmm. uh, to comply with the zoning bylaw, is that, I mean, it, isn't that a temporary activity versus a something happening for greater than six months a year, which would be a permanent activity? No, under the Wetlands Protection Act, even temporary activities are considered potential alterations of an area. So if someone says, oh, I'm only going to come in here for a little bit and do this, and then I'm going to restore it, they still have to file with the commission and pay the fees. That's just okay. the way the Wetlands Protection Act regulations are worded. Okay, and I, and I get that. Um, as far as the, the automobile issue versus structure, um, if I've got riverfront property and I want to go swimming down there and I park my car down there and it sits there for a day, maybe two. Um, is that something that would have to go in front of the, the state? Because it's still an automobile that's being parked on the riverfront. Okay, and so you're, you're kind of getting into like what ifs and whatevers. Um, if someone parked a vehicle there and it caused an alteration, like they dropped all their oil or their gas tank broke, that would then become a violation of the Wetlands Protection Act. Driving in, driving out for one day wouldn't necessarily be a violation. But if people, when people are setting up camps, they are not just staying in that footprint there. They have tables, they have chairs, they are walking around and altering includes the destruction of vegetation. Yes, vegetation can come back under the Wetlands Protection Act any destruction of vegetation in a resource area is considered a violation. Um, that's just the way the, the regulations are written. That's what the requirements are. Anything, because the people 
who have, I know some people are upset about the filing fees, but that's because they are within the first 100 feet from the um, mean annual high water mark. And they are in floodplain and they are in the floodway, some of them, of the Hadley. So that's two resource areas under the Wetlands Protection Act. There is also a 100 foot buffer zone um, extension from the top of the bank. So that's three resource areas that are regulated under the Wetlands Protection Act. So building a house, destruction of vegetation, um, just if you were out there day after day after day and you caused the vegetation to die, which when people are putting mats down, they're, you know, having building fire pits, they're putting chairs there, they're parking cars there, they're making a driveway. Um, okay, I'm sorry, I just saw something here in the chat. Um, well, what you're saying is if uh, you're worried about the veg uh, vegetation, the farmer shouldn't even plow and plant their crops within 100 feet of that riverbank. Is this what you're saying? Um, technically, right now, any new farming, uh, I believe, is existing farming is 25 feet. They give them an exemption, 25 feet from the high water mark. Um, because farming is considered as a different category. Um, new farming activity, I believe it has to be outside of the 100 foot. Um, someone did say that they, we were, they're upset about the Conservation Commission not being transparent at the Riverfront Bylaw Committee. I said point blank that you still have to file for a permit with the commission. No one ever asked me, nor did I, and maybe that was my fault for not assuming that people understood when you come before a board, you go to the planning board, you have to pay a fee. There's a permit fee based on the level of activity. Conservate, if you file a request for determination, it's a $50 fee. If you can move outside of the hundred foot, first hundred feet in the riverfront area, the com and depending on whether or not there's endangered species, that's out of our hands. That's the Natural Heritage Endangered Species Program who regulates that. Um, all of those things need to be taken into account. It's not just a blanket, hey, you can wanna put the camper down there. No, we have to look at it as if it's a resource, just like it's a wetland, a swamp, a river, a brook, anything like that, it's considered a resource area. That's defined under the State Wetlands Protection Act, the rivers, um, riversway um, regulations. That's nothing that we make up. It's just like planning board makes their, their regulations are based on Mass General um, 40A and 40B under zoning. They have, their regulations have to fall within those requirements. So is each, each piece of property mm -hmm. and each person owns their own property down there. Yep. They're Hadley taxpayers. They pay their property. If they allow other campers down there, are they charged one fee for their one piece of property? They are the way the Wetlands Protection Act and uh, Mr. Uh, Trey, he just asked a question too. Um, the Wetlands Protection Act defines activity as each item that's there. So that if I had a, a lot where I'm putting five houses on it, I have to pay a fee for each house. If it is, and in verifying, we've talked to DEP about this, and they have said, yes, each one counts because each area is subject to potential alteration of a resource area. Did I hear you say that if they are further back than 100 feet, these would not apply? If they are out of the commission, 
as the, the way the rivers um, regulations read is that the first hundred of the first 200 feet from the river, the high an mean annual high water mark, that area, the first hundred feet is considered critical for many different protections. The DEP has and overruled us in the past and has told us if we permit something in the first hundred feet and the person has the ability to move that activity out of the first hundred feet, DEP will overrule us. Matter of fact, they were at one of our meetings um, and we were told that, and this was just for a pavilion that was built illegally. It was built within the first hundred feet, within a hundred feet of the river. The property owner was told you have the ability because you have to do an alternatives analysis, you have the ability to move that structure out of the first 100 feet. So the commission legally cannot issue a, you a permit if you can move that out of the first 100 feet. The property owner made the decision that they didn't want to um, take it down and then have to reconstruct it and they made the decision that they were going to take it down and just not put it up again. So uh, chair of the committee, no disrespect to the conservation or my feeling is we all work together. Um, the whole committee was to, for the life safety and I'm, I'm getting the feedback. Um, none of the fees were brought up and this is, this is a lot of money for these poor um, people that have had these for 30, 40 years on the, on the riverfront. And I just wish that, you know, the fees were brought up to the, the committee and the, the people prior. Um, is there any way to, to consolidate it to per lot? I mean, or per parcel, like we were trying to do for the, you know, for the RVs, because this isn't a moneymaker. This is all life safety to, to make sure everything's, you know, uh, logged who's where and, and, and have a contact. Um, Mm -hmm. I just wish that, you know, they the were up part, about all this. Yes, the town part is life safety. Everyone who has had a camper there and did not file for a permit has been in violation of the Wetlands Protection Act for years. We have not had the staff or the ability or the means because we don't even have a full-time staff person or anyone really to do enforcement. I mean, I've gone out and stopped jobs and I have gone been gone up one side of myself and down the other with profanity. I've been called names. Um, Tommy, I don't know if people have done that to you, but if you walked out and you said this is a stop order, work order, they're going to go, oh, well, you have some clout about it because you're the building inspector. Being the chair of the Conservation Commission or Janice, who's our staff, when we have to do enforcement, we have no backing on this. I could call and get a police officer to come with me. I don't want to have to do that. I should not have to do that. I am enforcing the Conservation Commission is required to enforce the laws of the Commonwealth. And that's what we are doing. And, so, and I respect that. I just, I disagree with the interpretation that a camper is a structure. I get a pavilion's a structure, a gazebo's a structure, oh. something like that that doesn't move. But to me, a recreational activity like that, I get the vegetation part, you know, mowing, uh, chopping trees down, whatever, you know, happens there. I, that makes sense to me as altering and the Wetlands Act and whatever else. But the, the idea that a camper that's mobile and registered as a motor vehicle in the state is a structure. It's just, it's, we you know. are considering at it as an alteration to the land in the resource area, placing the camper there on the mats, on boards, on what we've seen out there, many places where they're not just parking the camper, they're putting it on something that right there considers constitutes the alteration of each activity. I think when they're placing things on boards or something, because um, well, I have a camper also, but I'm seasonal up north. Um, but what we do is we place it on boards or on stone or something like that so that it 
doesn't go down and damage the property or the uh, vegetation that's underneath the, the boards itself. It kind of holds the camper up so that it's not um, damaging any other area around it. So sometimes there's a reason for why they do that. It's not necessarily because they want it, you know, to do that. And again, it's only because they're, you know, they're six months out of the year and they're not using the facility all year long. So that does make an, uh, you know, make sense also. So um, right. I'm, I think that, you know, if we're, if we're saying to people, um, if you back off and are not on that hundred plane um, area that you shouldn't be um, to damage and where DEP comes in. And our most important thing in anything that we do is that we want to protect uh, the environment around us. And I think that's everybody's goal for what we're doing here. Uh, we certainly want to be able to have, um, I think we're the only town and area around us that are allowing campers along the riverfront. But this has been done for, I can't tell you, I've, I've been living in, in Hadley for 50 years. We put our boat in the river at um, Mitch's Marina. They had campers there. They don't have campers there anymore. Um, because of whatever has gone over this past year. Um, but everybody has tried to keep things safe and, and what we should be doing. And I think, you know, we're trying to work with everybody that has property down there. Um, if you're saying that they need to have a one-time fee and it's for three years and then they have to re-up in, in three years, making sure that it continues at a $50 fee, no, it's um, not even a $50. Well, if their request for determination, which is beyond that first hundred feet, that's a $50 fee every three years. Correct. It is a notice of intent and they continue to renew it before it expires. There's no additional fee for that. It gets okay. put on and somebody asks, do they have to keep doing the ad in the paper? If they are doing requests for determination, yes, that's a legal requirement. Hey, I paid $275 to put an ad in the paper to do work in my yard, which is 100% grass, because I have a ditch that's considered an intermittent stream behind my house. I even had to go through the process with the Conservation Commission. Yeah. So I understand that I don't set the fee for the, the ad in the paper. That's a legal requirement that people have to pay. Um, so, so now we look at each piece of property that each owner uses. Mm -hmm. Let's just go through a scenario here. Yeah. So yes, they use it during the camping season, probably starts end of May, beginning of end of rather April, beginning in May. So, and it carries them through until the end of maybe October, somewhere around that time. Um, some properties have how many per purse, but they're only allowed because we passed a bylaw not too long ago, only allowing four campers per site, correct? No. Five? The, the new requirements that the planning board and the river committee, this committee looked at was one camper, you need 2,500 square feet per camper and there was no limit as to the number of campers, except when you got over three, then you needed an additional permit from the Board of Health as a um, campground permit. Whether or not there's something under zoning that's got to do with that, that's got nothing to do with me. So 25, of, 25 feet apart, does that have anything? Um, to do with it at that time? The 25 feet apart is what the committee decided that it's 2,500. So if I had a 10,000 square foot lot uh -huh. um, or more, I could potentially put um, four campers on it as long as they were 25 feet apart and I could meet some of the requirements for distancing. And they were not they were not abutting the river itself. No, I think they had to, even, they if had it was to be on the river, depending on how far away I was, I'd have to file a permit under the state law. Okay. So 
what's happening is people are think pe the thought was that we're just going to pay this one fee to the building inspector and there's no other fees involved. Same and thing. I apologize if that was not made clear. We said you still need to get permitting from the Conservation Commission. It uh, never think... came up. I never said it. Maybe I should have that. Yes, there are fees with the Conservation Commission, just like if you file with the planning board or if you file for a permit with the Board of Health, there's a fee in involved in it. And, and that's that's what I was saying. Our biggest my biggest feedback from everybody, the the. Um, landowners is that that wasn't brought up front. We were talking 33, you know, for the permit to keep everything, you know, keep track of what was where a year, you know, three year permit for a hundred dollars. And now they're talking, I mean, I'm hearing from $2,500 to $500 and that's where I'm getting all the feedback. They wish they had known ahead of time. That's, that's, I all guess right. the big concern. Um, yeah. So right now what we have in front of us, and if I can, find it quick, I will. Um, so right now we have an application on Aquavita. It's for one RV, it's a $50 fee. We have, we have one, two, three, four requests for determinations in front of us. And that's for a total of two, four, 10 campers. Oh. So for 10 campers, it is, um, so $150, and that's going to get 10 people, 10 campers permitted. The notice of intent, one of, of which is within the first 100 feet of the riverfront area, it's in an endangered species area and it's in a floodplain, that's for five campers all within those three resource areas. It's $165 per camper. So that fee is $825. There is another one which will end up being seven campers within the floodplain, within the riverfront area, within a buffer zone and within endangered species program and that's $165 per camper. Um, some, that, that one in particular, we believe had a permit from the zoning board and therefore was an established, legally established use prior to August 1st, 1996, if they had the permits in there, because that's when the river um, regulations, the riverfront went into effect. So anything after that, if people were doing it within violation of the law, um, it doesn't give them a grandfathering. Our, we had many talks with our former um, building commissioner who did not want to take on the enforcement of these. So we were kind of left between a rock and a hard place because the town wasn't doing the enforcement, putting the Conservation Commission out there to be the bad guys, which I don't think is fair. Um, so yeah, uh, most people, so right now we have, so 10, 12. Uh, Janice had her hand up as well. Janice, did you have something? Um, I was just gonna say the, um, descriptions of the fees for the state um, filing fees is pretty, pretty detailed, but it still doesn't cover everything. And generally, normally what we do is if it's not described specifically, then it goes into category two, mm, let's see, um, J, which is any other activity not described in categories one, three, four, five, or six. Um, and that's $500. So what we've done is we've taken the lowest possible category for work that is clearly within our jurisdiction. And that's the first cutoff. If you're within that distance, it's like a tripwire. If you're within that distance, within that resource area, you have to file with the commission. Then the commission can determine whether your activity has an adverse effect 
on the resource or not. And if it doesn't, then we can permit the project. If it does, then there may have to be conditions and changes to the placement or whatever. So in most of these cases, from what Paulette and I have been looking at as we go out, people are far enough back. They're not you know, in a wetland or different things like that, that it seems like for the most part, we'll be able to approve it saying, okay, you're not gonna have a negative impact on the resource area as long as you keep doing these things, not cutting trees, not mowing natural areas, um, not putting in permanent structures, that, those sort of things. But the first cutoff is, are you within our jurisdiction on the land? And if you are, you're supposed to file with us. So that's, that's how we, where it starts really. And then like you're saying, okay, you know, if they're there for six months, are they gonna have an impact or not? That's what we look at during the public meeting or the public hearing. And I understand all that. I guess as the chair of the committee and representing, you know, the, you know, the, the whole, the town for this, I just feel we didn't represent the people on the river, the cost of what this was going to be. We, we, you know, tried to cut it down to a hundred per lot or, or parcel. And, and, you know, then we went to the 33, you know, which come out to 33 per camper if there's three and a uh, long story. I just feel, I wish this was brought up. We had two members from conservation at the time and, and I understand the people's concern that nobody knew this expense was going to be there. Um, and, and I'm getting all the feedback and it just doesn't seem fair for people that have had campers for, you know, 30 years on there to, to get this thrown at them. I, I, you know, I, like I said, no disrespect to the conservation. I just wish that we had let them know that in this, in these meetings. But in all due fairness, anyone who has a legal dock knows that they have to have a permit. Anyone who files with the Conservation Commission has to have a permit. Most people have had some interaction with the Conservation Commission at some point if you are in a resource area or near a resource area. They've had that. Um, you know, I didn't hear us discussing the Board of Health's fees for anything. We, we talked about get, having to get a permit from the Board of Health, but the whole list of fees that they potentially do or require wasn't discussed either. It was said, you need a permit, okay? Do, do they need permits from the fire department for propane tanks? And is there a fee associated with that? Is that was that uh, specifically discussed? No, because it's based on the type of activity. We did not get into that minutia. And my understanding, you know, when we all talked about these things, you know, and I'm going to say it, Johnny Mitch Jr. and I actually agreed on something, which I thought was pretty good, um, was that, you know, when you go to a campground, you're paying anywhere from 30 to 70, maybe $100 a night to be there. We're permitting you to be in an area that is a protected area under the state law. And we're giving you a permit for three years. If it's a notice of intent, it could go on for multiple years as long as the permit requirements did not run out or expire. I, I, have, a, I have a comment here. I, I don't think that people are upset with the fees is what I'm getting. I think they were upset with how, how it came about. Um, to me, who's a seasonal camper, not here, but in, on the beach area in Salisbury, um, I'm paying a good amount of money per season to, to camp up there. We have our, what we have to follow is our rules and regulations as any other places. And I think, you know, overall in looking at things, um, this is really kind of a cheap way to go to tell you the truth, to be able to access your property. I know you own it. And I understand that part of it, that I don't want to infringe on people's rights on their own property. But when it abuts the river and we are 
mandated by certain restrictions in Hadley with DEP and other areas of what needs to take place, I think people in general are very respective of how they treat their property on the riverfront. And I'm hoping that this can all be resolved between our, our inspectors and our conservation and the people that use the property on the riverfront that all we want is for you to have the right to use your own property to the way that you want to. But I also, we have fees that we have to um, have uh, accepted and, and they're minimal is what I'm hearing tonight um, that's going to last you maybe a lifetime if you don't change anything that you already have. Um, so, you know, I'm in favor of what we're doing here. Um, and all everybody join together and just make these fees possible, accept them, and then move forward. And then everybody just be, not be transparent, um, but you know, at least be aware and be upfront with us and not overcrowd your properties down there um, with more campers than what you've already said that you're going to put down there. I want people to be able to enjoy the Connecticut River. It's a great place. It's, it's good a waterway. Um, and it's what we always have used for our whole lifetime here in Hadley. So I think in, in doing these kind of things, I, I would appreciate that everybody just work together. And I think that's what we're trying to do. Just be upfront, get these fees out there. I think it's a good fee for people to have this opportunity to use their property and keep it clean. Um, when I water skied on the Connecticut River 50 years ago, when I started dating my husband and bought a boat, the river was not clean. You never knew if you were going to come up with a brownie on your nose because that's the way that the Connecticut River was. And that's what that's what we used to say years ago. So I'm dating myself. Um, but the river is clean now and we want to keep it that way. And it's it's an enjoyment for everybody to be able to use this property. So I guess I've been long winded here, but I think that I think you should all get the gist of let's just all enjoy what we have and keep it clean and just accept, accept it. I've got uh, two hands that have been up for a while, Bill. Thank you. Uh, I just wanna be uh, sure everyone is very clear on where we are procedurally. At this point, the uh, flood overlay district that we originally adopted in 1987 is in full effect. And that bylaw provides for one mobile residential unit or one RV per lot with a special permit from the ZBA. Uh, the amendment that we are proposing for the annual town meeting is what will allow multiple RVs on a lot subject to the some distancing and with a permit from the building inspector and from other boards if and as required. That has not yet been adopted, but I wanted to be very clear that if the proposed amendment that will be coming up in May is voted down for any reason, that does not change the current bylaw and we will be back to one camper per lot with a uh, special permit from the ZBA. Uh, there is a procedural reason why we can proceed with permitting now because of when a zoning article presumptively takes effect. I won't bore you with the details of that, but there is a reason why we are able to start processing these applications for seasonal use this summer. We don't have to wait until town meeting, but, um, but if town meeting does not choose to accept the proposed amendment, then, then yeah, we're back to square one, one unit per, per lot. So um, I just wanted to be clear that this is where we are. We're in a transition period, but we haven't completed the transition yet. So we have a few more steps to take. So in other words, if you like having more than one camper show up for town meeting and vote for the new bylaw. 
Absolutely. Hey, right. David, I got a question. Sure. Paula and uh, Janet said uh, they, they did the letter of the law there and they both read it twice, that it's up to the commission. What does the rest of the Conservation Commission feel about this and the fee structure? Do the rest of the commission vote already not to waive the fee uh, on the town section, or is this just your your two interpretations right now? The, well, just one. I th I think you're asking two different things. The commission does not have any right to waive the state fees. I didn't say that. I said the, the town portion of the fee. The town portion of the fee, the only fee, we can't waive that. That's automatic. That's per state law. 50% goes to the state, 50% goes to the town for administration of the act. If the select board wants to hire someone full time, that money would go to support them. Our fees are paying for our staff person right now. Um, oh, it could be waived if the commission voted not no. to no, the only thing we could waive potentially, um, and Janice, you can correct me on this, would be the bylaw fee, which is $50. And that's yeah. for all the requests for determinations. And we haven't voted on it because all of these have been coming in since the last meeting and they'll be on the agenda for the first time um, on April 13th. And so we haven't met and I'm just following our standard procedure, which is $25 for a single family home um, project and $50 for any other project. And that's the, that's the local, the record uh, request for determination fee. Right. And that's so under the bylaw. And it's not under the Wetlands Protection Act. All right. So I guess that's something for uh, people to make their case to the, at the conservation meeting on the 13th, if they want that $50 fee waived, uh, that's for the commission to decide. Uh, Rob Baranowski, ha you've had your hand up for a long time, sir. What did you want to? Yeah, I'm just, uh, the, the thing that I'm asking is the interpretation of the single family house as it relates to an RV. You said that was the closest thing possible. Yet you, when you were given all your examples, of mats, boards, chairs, fire pits, why wouldn't that be just altering vegetation? And if it's altering vegetation, then it's one single activity rather than one per camper. Because that's all the RVs are gonna do, right? They're, they're gonna alter vegetation. They're gonna sit on the grass well, or the lawn or the... So that is where the interpretation piece came in because there, it doesn't say anything about an RV. So that, that's right. my question. If, if you look at, unfortunately, and Joyce brought it up, if you look at the coastal regulations under the Wetlands Protection Act, the coastal regulations specifically mention um, campers, campgrounds. They did not put that for whatever reason in the non-coastal regulations. We are, when we have to look at determining the fee and someone could just submit their fee and say, this is how we believe the commission has to look at it. Our staff, we all look at it and we say whether we agree with the fee that's been submitted or not. If we do not agree with it or DEP does not agree with it, we can't go forward with a hearing. So therefore it's a month, you're delayed another month. I agree with you, but th this whole thing, as you've said, and, and Janice has said through many, many meetings I've sat in, this is all new. This is trying to, I mean, trying to shoehorn what we were trying to do into the request for determination or the notice of intent was next to impossible because it never said anything about a camper. But why, again, just the, the simplicity of your opinion as to why you interpreted it as a single family home and not altering vegetation because all your examples were altering vegetation. No, that was the definition of okay. what an activity or alter means. When you look okay. at the fee categories, if what Janice explained was that we tried to take the fee that was the most reasonable and kind of make the camper work. Otherwise, it is falls under the activity of 
anything else that's not specifically listed, which is $500 per activity if it's not specifically listed. So if I'm going to use your argument that, hey, it's not a camp, it's not a house, let's do $500 per activity. We didn't want to do that. We didn't think that was right. Well, it's an activity would be just at that point, if I can do the math right, for two of those people, the activity of changing vegetation would be mm -hmm. one no, no, activity. No. You're the saying- activity, An activity is what's taking place on the land. So there's parking areas that are gonna be established. There are camp areas that are gonna be established. People are gonna have living areas. So in a sense, an area dedicated to their camp where they're gonna be, you know, um, picnic tables, sitting, and all of that. All of that is we are constituting as one activity per camper. That's our um, argument for that. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Well, then, uh, I guess you guys can make the the campers can make their case to the conservation commission uh, as far as the fees go on the thirteenth. But um, we're not going to solve that problem tonight. So. Um, Paulette, thank you, and Tony and uh, Janice, and if I forgot anybody else, thanks for spending the time. Um, and hopefully it brought a little bit of transparency to things for people. So any, uh, any last comments from the select board for conservation before I move on? Yeah, I'd really like to see that, uh, that section of the law that they're pertaining to that says it's a house. It, it, it's absolutely a registered vehicle. You know, uh, I, I really need to see that determination. Okay. John, that uh, is what we determined is the most. And that's my question. You as the board or you and Janice? Um, me as chairman okay. to try and move these, to try and move these permits forward. We could say we're not, we cannot schedule any hearings and meet on April and say, okay, everybody, this is what the board decided. And now therefore it will go, you, we will not hold your permit hearings until May, until the, these things are established. And what we, as I said, what we are trying to do is to get the most affordable permit application instead of any other activity or anything else that isn't specifically listed is a $500 fee per activity. So we have taken it down from 500 to 110 per activity. That's what we've done. And before I told the first, first people what the fee was going to be for the notice of intent, I did talk to the staff person that we always talk to at DEP, which is what the conservation agents and chairs do all the time. If you're not absolutely sure, you call DEP and you ask them. So I, I called and I asked, how should I interpret this? You know, how should I deal with the campers? Does it make sense to do it as this category 1A? And they said, yes. And I said, so is that one category or more? And he said, well, it says right on the directions. The example is six houses, six categories. So, you know, and I said, so does that mean six campers, six activities, whatever? And he said, yeah. So that was the informal discussion that DEP does not tend to like to put things in writing, but that's our standard procedure. If we have any question, we call DEP and ask for their interpretation since it's a state law and state regulations. That's the information I got and that's why I went the way I did with it. And the other reason for that, just to follow through with that is because during these committee meetings, Janice and I were under a lot of pressure hurry up, hurry up, get some guidance out there, put some things together for us. And that's what we did. Have, have we contacted um, Paulette, um, our town council to see how we're proceeding with this? I mean, you already know how I felt. I went on a rampage there a little bit ago um, of, of how I feel, but I'm just thinking that, you know, just to get a, some type of determination uh, making sure we're following all the right guidelines. I know actually over the years that DEP is the uh, guru of all of us in determining what happens on the 
um, the Connecticut River and any waterways. Um, so I always respect what DEP has to offer us. They, you know, uh, have guided us and given us restrictions on a lot of things we've done um, throughout the town. But have we actually had any um, uh, activity from our town council? So it might behoove us to at least touch base with them, maybe if you, before town meeting um, and just, you know, try to go along with what we have right now and get some type of determination from them. How does everybody else on the board feel about that? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if they deal with environmental law all the time or if that's somebody different. I don't, I don't know enough about town council's experience with that, so. Yeah, there's not a lot of lawyers. From, a lot of lawyers, from my experience of uh, what what personally I had to deal with with uh, DEP, but um, there aren't too many lawyers out there that in, in are involved with environmental problems. Um, so I'm not sure. It's a question for them. Probably wouldn't hurt to ask them and see would- if we are guided by DEP and their recommendations, but. Uh, maybe just touch base with our town council and see what they say. Yeah, that. Yeah. I was going to say, Caroline, can we check yeah. with our legislatures? There's other larger bodies of rivers in Massachusetts, the Merrimack, Connecticut. There's some larger uh, rivers that may be affected that somebody has made a decision on. And maybe DEP is wrong in their interpretation of the law. So. Uh, just so you know, I had Janice had a conversation with our um, point person in the Western region. Um, each region deals with their regulations different because of the different resource areas. I also had a conversation with the section chief, and he was very clear to us that the commission itself has the ability and has to make the justification as best they can. And DEP um, cannot say 100% yes, go for it. You cannot do that. No one is going to tell us that because if permits get appealed, if someone doesn't like the decision, DEP becomes the adjudicatory board. So they cannot advise us specifically into something that they may be reviewing as an appeal. And just as I said, we have to, every commission has to look at what is the closest thing that's there. If you want us to go for the any other activity, then you're actually being counterproductive because that's $500 each versus $110 each. And that's pretty much the lowest fee under the Wetlands Protection Act is the 110 for a notice of intent. Carolyn, you had something? Just that I can contact the firm that we use. They have, they have attorneys that specialize in every area of municipal government. And I, I think if, if it's okay with the board, if I can just meet with Janice um, and just get all of the information correctly worded so that I can pre- prepare a good question for them to review. That's what I, that would be my recommendation, but I will leave that up to the board if you want to do it differently. No, my that question, sounds, sounds great. My question would be, yes, if they'll give us, so to speak, a quick opinion as opposed to spending hours and hours of research on the whole process and charging the town huge sums of money mm-hmm. only to come out and say, oh, DEP has right of the right to do this anyway. Unfortunately, you will get what you pay for. I can ask for a quick review, but they will follow up and say, this is just, you know, this is a very basic review. So I, I will first find out how much it will cost if they can be, a, if they can give me a guesstimate. Um, and, I, and I'll use my reasonable assumption, whether it's uh, um, outrageous or not, but it, it looks like what you're looking for will take a little bit more than just, you know, a conversation. They might have to do a little digging. Yeah, it'll be more than a quick reference, I think. But, you know, if we're going to uh, expose ourselves or the conservation is going to expose themselves to litigation, then it's worth spending a couple of bucks to see where we're at and, and what the ruling would be on it. So the, I, I kind we of are exposing that. ourselves to litigation in the, in the sense that if someone doesn't like the decision that the Conservation Commission issues, 
it goes to DEP. DEP takes the information from the commission, they take the appeal from the applicant, and they make the decision. Um, they overrule, but they have the ability to overrule the commission. They have the ability to overrule us even if we grant a permit and they can say, you were wrong in issuing that permit, which they've done in the past. We do I, not get legal liability on that. Right, I agree with you. DEP is an entity of itself. Yeah, um, we get worried too, if we get involved in this between conservation and DEP, if we say we believe it's this way, all of a sudden we're putting ourselves in jeopardy as well. I kind of feel like leave it to Conservation Commission and DEP to come to a decision on the fee and us not to get involved at all because we're putting our foot in something it should not be in. And we're giving sure. advice to people that we really shouldn't be giving and we're putting ourselves at jeopardy. Yeah, I do too. I agree with Christian. Okay, well, uh, again, thanks for spending the time, Janice and Tony and uh, uh, Paulette. Appreciate you coming. Uh, it took longer than I thought it would, sorry. Okay. <laughs> it always does. It's a complicated issue, so. Thank right. you. Well, thank you guys. For giving us All a right. chance. Yep. So we'll, uh, we'll move on here. And I think all we have left is uh, announcements and an executive session for tonight. So uh, before we do, Announcements. Christian, did you want to say anything? <laughs> I, I, did, I did not have time to prepare any kind of statement, but I just wanted to, you know, thank everybody um, on the board for all their efforts and, um, you know, discussion over the years. I've always felt like we might disagree on something, but we always listen to each other. And I think that's really important and really great. And then, you know, my biggest thanks is just to all the town staff and all the departments, just how great it's been to work every, with everyone and how just, you know, everybody has really good communication, I feel like, in these meetings and um, understanding of their viewpoints and where they're coming from when they're making decisions. And it's really great to work with everybody. You're frozen. Christian, you froze. <laughs> I, I would like to thank Christian um, for participating in the select board and volunteering all of his time for all the committees that he has volunteered on. Uh, the library, um, you put a lot of effort into that and getting that up and moving and uh, opened as it is not right now. So, um, you, of course, you have a standing invitation um, saying from the select board to Please be with us when we do the open houses that when we're able to do that. Um, but I'm hoping that you're not going to just let it go. I know when people have their own businesses, it's very hard to um, give of time and effort to uh, the town because it actually sometimes because a full, becomes a full-time job. Um, so you know, your business is your business and that's your money maker. It takes care of your family, but I'm hoping somewhere down the road and as time goes on that you'll be still able to participate in some of our committees and uh, maybe come back at another time and um, join us again. I'll be gone by then. But anyway, um, thank you for all that you've done for the town and the, in, the, in your time of select board. We appreciate it. Thank you, Joyce. It's been really great to work with you. I've learned a lot from you, so thank you. Thank you. Yes, and I'll thank you for all the work you put in on the Senior Center Building Committee, plus the work I've done with you on the select board. That's been great. And, you know, wave when we drive by, okay? I definitely will wave. Thank you, Jane. Yeah, I don't know if I'd be here without all of your inspiration throughout the years, like what you did with the Senior Center and all that kind of stuff, so thank you. Yeah. yeah, good job, Christian. You did a good job as chairman for the while that you were on. Yeah, good job with Capital and all the uh, million other committees that you had volunteered for. It wasn't just the select board. I, I There was probably, what, another five, six committees on top of that. So thanks for all your time. I know, um, you know, this takes a lot more time than anybody realizes. So uh, 
Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I'll, I'll miss all of you. So I, I hope to be back one day. We'll see what happens in the future, but thank you. Hey, we know where you live. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> right down the street. So. We'll be I, I, saw, I saw your campers ready to go, Joyce. So I can tell you're you're going out of town soon. <laughs> we're, we're, we're getting there. We're getting there, Christian. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again, Christian. And uh, anybody have any, uh, Joyce, did you want to talk about the fire department tonight or save it for another night or? I'll, I'll save that for another night, but I, because I did have um, a few condolences tonight that I've been a little bit, um, wayward in, I guess you would say, for the past uh, couple of weeks. But um, I'd like to offer our condolences to Mar Marilyn Stillwall, uh, who lives in, he had lived in town, and condolences to her husband, Glenn. Uh, we also had uh, condolences to a Marion Bach. Um, she is, was the mother of mother of Susan Hitchcock, and she's also a town resident. We have a resident, Elizabeth Noonan. Uh, our condolences to her sister and Carl Konesny and his uh, condolences to his wife, Anne, and his children that live in town. Uh, Carl was head of the excavating company that has done many projects in town and um, who's a great guy. And so condolences to his family also. Uh, we had Car Robert Kosmeski, who was a resident of Northampton, but a local pharmacist. But his son, Robert Kosmeski, lives here in town. So our, our co condolences to his family also. We had um, Steve Warren, who was a resident of Sunderland. Um, his daughter, Diane West, lives here in town and his grandchildren. He was a retired lieutenant from the Amherst uh, Police Department who was head of the, actually was the first one to begin the horse uh, patrol over there at UMass. We also have um, condolences to the family of Charles Sinkowitz. He was a longtime resident of Hadley. He passed away in Florida. He was the owner of Aquavita, where the Pride Station is and Roberto's restaurant in Northampton. His uh, ex-wife took over the uh, restaurant in Northampton, Roberto's, um, but a longtime resident here. And he has his uh, daughter, um, Terry S uh, Smith, that lives here in town and other daughters um, and grandchildren. So condolences to their family also. So um, that's it for this evening on my part, but um, select board does send condolences to out to all of these families. Any other announcements other than we have an election next, uh, the, let me get it right. The 13th of April, correct. And anybody have the times for that? I don't want to give the wrong times out. Nine until eight. Okay. And that's at the, senior, the center. senior center. Yeah. We'll have to touch base with Jessica on when to be sworn in for our meeting for the next night. So make sure anybody that is um, running, uh, we need to touch base to see how we can get sworn in for the, our next uh, official meeting on Wednesday night. Correct, and the select board meets next on uh, Wednesday the 14th, the day following the election at uh, 5.30 via Zoom. Uh, any other announcements for this evening? All right, we have an executive session this evening. Uh, let's see. The select board will enter into executive session per MGL chapter 30A section 21A2 uh, to conduct strategy session in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel or to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel, which is our fire chief, Chief Bank Nibble. Uh, so if I could get a motion to go to executive session, please, and not reconvene an open session. So moved. Second. All right. Motion by Joyce, second by Christian. And uh, let's see, as chair of the Hadley Select Board, I state that the board has moved and seconded to enter into executive session and that I state that discussing the matter in open session will have an adverse effect on the town of Hadley. And Jennifer, roll call vote, please. Roll call vote, Phil. 
Yes. Chungalu? Yes. For the very last time, Stanley? Yes. <laughs> Nevin Smith? Yes. And Wiskevitz? Yeah. John? Oh, thank yeah. you. I didn't hit the button in time. <laughs> All right. Good night, everybody.